Um, so what I would like to talk about today, I mean, it's something that uh, uh, bothered me a while ago. Um, is actually when I was uh, with, I, I was studying uh, philosophy of probability and I didn't know much about probability or quantum mechanics, but uh, I had uh, a great teacher, Itamar Pitovsky. And in the course, uh, it was a long time ago, so about 1990, I think. <laughs> um, in the course, he mentioned, uh, he talked about uh, interpretation of probability in relation to quantum mechanics. And one of the interpretation that he talked about is uh, Definetti, very subjective, extremely subjective uh, probability. And uh, he suggested that uh, uh, there might be a problem in applying this interpretation to quantum mechanics. Um, so what I would like to talk about is uh, uh, first, I mean, try to explain, to make sense of his worry. Because I think that uh, uh, it's also related to the work of uh, Another important work on probability in quantum mechanics, uh, Itamar Pitovsky wrote a book on probability in quantum mechanics, Poloto, po, po, Polytops, uh, those of you who know, and, and I think uh, is uh, very interesting and important, but also Arthur Fine uh, worked on uh, spelling inequality. So I think uh, they have somewhat similar view, I, I would say, about this. And, and so the first part that we try to motivate uh, why there was a worry, um, and then in the second part, I will uh, develop the interpretation of uh, a, a definitely, I, I will present the, def the interpretation of probability and then uh, try to show how one can apply it to quantum mechanics. Now, the interesting thing is that uh, my understanding of definitely is different from the normal understanding. So you get a probability theory which is not classical in some sense. And uh, so we will see. Um, so that's definitely. Um, very important, one of the uh, founding fathers of modern subjective probability, together with Ramsey. And they actually developed the ideas independently, so it's interesting, about the same time, mid to late 20s, they started. Um, okay, so this is the structure of the talk. I mean, the first part would be section one and two. Um, so the first part, I mean, would be more general motivation, the second one, would be consideration of probability in relation to Bell theorem. What is Bell theorem about? Uh, there is a debate uh, uh, whether it's about probabilities or about causality or, or whatever. And then the second part, section three or, or five, will be trying to see how the finity applies to quantum mechanics. So, okay. So, so, so the background was the course on philosophy of probability. And the question that Itamar uh, uh, posed, I mean, was whether a, an extreme subjective interpretation probability, uh, whether Definetti's probability could uh, be applied to quantum mechanics. That was before people actually talked about it much. I think uh, Chris Fuchs and his associate and other people, I mean, started the mid 90s, I mean, to think about this, if, I, if I'm correct. Uh, so, um, so it was kind of surprising and there wasn't uh, much about it. Now, he wasn't worried about the fact that uh, the finity is very extreme. He says probability doesn't exist in the world. It's only uncertainty. And the interesting thing that he can go a long way with that and prove a lot of things. So th that wasn't the problem. The problem was more about uh, the question of whether uh, a classical probability theory uh, could, uh, uh, could be compatible with the non-classical structure of uh, quantum probability. So just leaving aside the fact that it's extreme, uh, that's not part of the point. So it's more uh, lo the logic of probability in quantum mechanics, in a sense. Um, so, and, and it was in the context of uh, the EPR experiment, uh, the Clausen and Horn version of the EPR. So you have like a, a, a particle, let's say in the singlet state, uh, they are entangled and uh, you, uh, one can measure a spins in different direction on each of the particle and the spin are incompatible. So spin in direction A and direction A prime on the left particle and B and B prime on the right particle. And then you just look at the probability of outcomes and the correlation between them. Um, so uh, Bell's idea was, I mean, now the, the, the particles, I mean, the measurement, are, as we know, uh, the measurement outcomes are curiously correlated. 
even if it's at a distance and doesn't matter according to quantum mechanics how far it is and uh, it seems like unreasonable to think that there is some signal going in between but still they are correlated in a strange way which suggests that there is some non-local influence and now we call it causality although causality is a very ambiguous uh, uh, notion. Um, and uh, uh, Bell uh, and, and Einstein, Podolsky, Rosen thought uh, that it's due to the incompleteness of quantum mechanics rather than some, uh, uh, some, some, some causation between the measurement outcomes uh, in the left wing and the right wing of the experiment. And, uh, uh, and Bell, I think, in his model, I mean, tried to make sense of the ideas that uh, uh, EPR had in mind. And, and basically, the idea is that a uh, correlation have causal explanation. Either correlation between distance events, either uh, they are either because of causal con direct causal connection between them, or because of a common cause. And if the correlation are due to the common cause, if the particle somehow correlated because uh, of the way they are preparing the source, and they don't, I mean, they don't influence each other later on, uh, then uh, there would be a, a local. Uh, local explanation, local meaning no, no superluminal causation uh, of the correlation between the outcomes. Um, so Bell gives the example of uh, you have, a, I don't know, black and uh, pink socks and uh, they are in a box and you said one to New York and the other one to London and you know that one of them has to be black and the other one pink so I mean you discover you're black, you know that the other one is pink, there is no action at a distance, so nothing strange is going on. Okay, uh, so the model that, uh, Bo, uh, that uh, uh, Bell uh, uh, had in mind, the local model that are supposed to reproduce the quantum uh, statistics, have basically two main assumptions. One of them is that the probability of outcome given uh, some complete state. I mean, EPR thought that the, the state, the quantum state is an incomplete state of the particle. If there was a complete state of the particle, um, then uh, uh, given these states, the probability of outcome would factorize, meaning that there will be just the, 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 the joint probability of outcome would be just the product of the probability of each of them. Something that doesn't happen uh, when we take instead of uh, uh, instead of lambda, which is the, supposed to be the complete state, if we take just quantum state. Um, so that's one condition. The other condition, which seems very plausible, is that, I mean, there could be different uh, complete states in, in, a, in a, any given uh, non-complete uh, quantum states. So there is a distribution over these uh, complete states. And the idea is that it doesn't depend on which type of measurements we make. So whatever measurements uh, we make, whether we decide to measure in the A direction or A prime direction or B or B prime or not to measure at all, uh, the distribution will be the same. Um, because we can also decide the measurement, uh, which measurement we make at the last moment and, and to think that uh, uh, there is a correlation between the type of measurement that we make, I mean, or the, the type of measurement that we make, I mean, uh, somehow is relevant to the distribution of the state of the particles at the source would mean either that there is a backward causation or there is some kind of uh, conspiracy, usually, I mean, it's called. Um, anyway, these are two, condi th these two conditions, uh, a, these two conditions are sufficient to derive certain probabilistic inequalities, certain relation between probabilities that turns, uh, the, these are the Bell inequalities that turn out to be a they turn out to violate uh, the quantum statistics, the, the probabilities of quantum mechanics. So basically, we know that one of these conditions has to go if we want a quantum theory. Um, but anyway, these two assumptions, so uh, I, I will, I mean, uh, I will show you, I mean, the, the inequalities later. So at the moment, I mean, it's just certain relation between probabilities of outcomes. And the point is that these two conditions leads to certain constraint on the probability of outcome that are incompatible with the constraint of quantum yeah. mechanics. So is the random independent uh, equivalent to the way that Bell formulated it in the integral over the space of lambda? Yes, so yes. Yes, yes, that you integral over, I mean, uh, yeah, over lambda without worrying about, you know, which measurement you make.
because otherwise, if that's violated, I mean, you can still have, even with this condition of locality, you can still have uh, the quantum correlation. It's not explicit in Bell, but yeah. Uh, yeah. What is the size? The size, the quantum state. Well, it has, but the, the distribution of the, I mean, it's, it's, it's quite implausible to have a theory, quantum theory, in which the hidden variable is not dependent on the quantum state, the distribution. Yeah. But, but, yeah, psi, you, you can think about preparation that give rise to psi. I mean, I, it's, no, it's, it's just to make things easy. I mean, it's not the center of my talk. Uh, I mean, you, if you want, I mean, just do some preparation in sense. But, but, but the probability of, uh, and, and you can think about the quantum state just as an ignorant uh, state. So that, that just point out to some other thing. So it's not, it's, not, it's not a big deal, but it has to depend somehow on quantum state one way or another. Otherwise, I think it's very difficult, I mean, to build such a theory. Anyway, I mean, it's not so important. We can come back to it later. Uh, the point, I mean, is that uh, lambda independence, I mean, these states, I mean, this condition seems to be very reasonable. I mean, and almost nobody except for small group um, uh, of people, I mean, question it. Uh, those, who, those who think about, for instance, uh, uh, I know that Aronov talked about the two states, I mean, uh, interpretation. This violates, I mean, this condition. Um, uh, so if you have a, a, a theory that has both forward and, and backward causation, then there is a violation of this condition. But, I mean, otherwise, most of the people just take it for granted. And if you take it for granted, then uh, it means that the quantum mechanics or any alternative theory, hidden variable, or whatever you want to call it, will have to violate factorizability. And the violation of factorizability uh, is usually uh, commonly considered or interpreted as some kind of non-locality. Because factorizability is supposed to be a locality condition. OK. Um, there are dissenting views. And one of them, um, so there was Nancy Cartwright. There were a number of people who say that factorizability is not a locality condition. And uh, uh, the, there is the view that Arthur Fine expressed that, uh, that probabilities uh, correlation need not have causal explanation. But I want to focus actually on, on some other uh, a challenge that he has and uh, some other view. And, and his view is that um, the Bell's theorem, um, as I presented it, is about non-locality. It, it's supposed to show that quantum theory is supposed to be non-local while, uh, while how to find things that it's not about that, that, that basically what we are assuming is a joint distribution of a hidden variable. And the hidden variable in our experiment, you can think about all the different kinds of spin that you can measure. So if you can measure spin in direction x or y on the left particle and y and z on the right particle, so you assume that there is a distribution over all these uh, uh, four spins, a joint distribution. Uh, which in quantum mechanics doesn't exist because they are incompatible properties. Spin x and y on the same particle are incompatible properties, so there is no probability of the particle having spin x up and spin y down, for instance. Um, okay, so just quotation, I think uh, it's very clear what he says. He says that, uh, um, so, so basically, what he's saying, I mean, that what Bell did, I mean, in disguise, is assuming a joint uh, probability distribution, and what he shows is, uh, and, and something that you, that is really the, the rejection of which is the essence of quantum mechanics, that there cannot be such a joint probability. Um, okay, so his word, I mean, the first, uh, so, and then he proves, I mean, he, he proves mathematically some theorems in uh, three papers in 1982 uh, that I think were influential that uh, are supposed to show certain things about the relationship between hidden variable model and joint distribution. And the first result is uh, 
uh, to show that the existence of deterministic hidden variable is strictly equivalent to the existence of joint distribution probability. Uh, P A, you think you can think about A as spin of, of the left particle in the A direction, A prime spin up of the particle in, in the A prime direction, and, and the same for and B and B prime are for the for the R particle, the relation B and B prime. Uh, for the four observable of the experiment, so these are spins in, in his, uh, uh, I mean, it could be generalized, but he actually focuses on spin. Once they return the probability of the experiment as marginal. Um, so, so the hidden variables are the spin. The particles are supposed to have spins before, even before the measurement, although according to the quantum state, they don't have any definite spin. The singlet state, the particle have no definite spin in any direction before the measurement. Okay, and then he says necessary and sufficient for the existence of the deterministic hidden variable model is that the Bell, uh, Clausen, Noren inequality is one version of the Bell inequalities, this probabilistic inequality that I will talk about in a minute, um, a hold for the experiment. So we have first, I mean, that it's, uh, that it's equivalent to have a joint probability and having hidden variable, uh, deterministic hidden variable. Now we have another thing that it's equivalent to say that there is a deterministic hidden variable and that there are the Bell inequalities holding. And the third condition is that stochastic hidden variable um, exists if and only if there is a deterministic hidden variable. So basically what we get, if you believe my uh, logic, um, that uh, there exists uh, that uh, uh, that the existence of a joint distribution over the four hidden variables, the spins, uh, is equivalent to the satisfaction of uh, Bell and Clausen inequality, and this is also equivalent to the existence of uh, deterministic and indeterministic uh, uh, hidden variable model. Okay? And that's a mathematical result, actually. I mean, what he does, I mean, I think that PRM is fine, mathematically speaking, is fine. Uh, uh, well, given the assumption, the implicit assumption that he has, yes, they, they are. But, but I agree that there is some way of, uh, I mean, some interpretation or some implicit assumption. But what is important for me is that the existence of joint probability over A, A prime, B and B prime, which are the spins before the measurement of the left particle, two spins of the left particle and two spins, two incompatible spins of the left particle and two incompatible spins of the right particle, um, um, equivalent to the uh, to this inequality that I'm going to talk about in a moment. Okay, is, is it clear so far? I mean, that's really important. Okay, um, now leave quantum mechanics. Let's talk a, a, a minute, uh, a moment uh, about uh, Definetti, and then we connect it and, and we see what was the challenge that Itamar Pitovsky had in mind. Um, so. Uh, so uh, just to just to say something about uh, uh, Fine's reasoning, how to find reasoning, Itamar Pitovsky had, I think, similar view, view in mind that the, that uh, at that time that uh, uh, that Bell inequalities, I mean, is about joint probability at the end of the day. Um, okay, so definitely maintain that degrees of belief uh, that for degrees of the probabilities are based on degrees of belief. So we are ignorant about things, and it doesn't matter why we are ignorant, just because we are lazy or we don't know or there is no answer, it doesn't matter. Uh, and, and then we have degrees of belief, and uh, uh, if degrees of beliefs are coherent, they satisfy uh, the probability axioms and theorems. And, uh, and, and, and basically, the coherent degrees of belief in things that we are uncertain about are probabilities. Basically, our probability theory is, uh, is just coherence, being coherent about your degrees of belief, your partial beliefs, not full beliefs. Um, now, this is usually uh, expressed by the idea that degrees of belief should be represented by probability function. So if, if you want to be coherent, you want your degrees of belief to be, be represented by a probability function. And, and many times it, it is assumed, though implicitly, that agents have one probability function that uh, over all the degrees of belief that they have. 
I mean, in, in whatever. So, you know, some could be about quantum mechanics, some could be about, uh, you know, their life. They want to buy a house. They think about, I mean, the, the, the share, I mean, the prices in the market and so on. And if you want, I mean, examples, uh, I, I think uh, two notable examples. One is uh, David Lewis. If you see in his paper, basically, I mean, he implicitly presupposes it. And, and another person is, is uh, uh, um, what's his name, Carnap. Uh, we will see. I mean, when, when you see Definetti's interpretation, you will see what it means. Uh, but, but the idea is that, that, you know, I have different, I'm uncertain about a lot of things, and I put all these, so these are events or proposition about events. I put all this in my probability space, and now I have one probability function, um, and, and, and therefore I'm coherent about all my, all, all the things that I'm uncertain about. So this is formally very similar to the classical Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so so are, are, are we allowed to say no attitude to have a coherent the, I, I think uh, one has to make the distinction between the normative and descriptive. I think that for definetti, I mean, it's a normative thing. It's not that you know we really do it. So we have to learn probability in order to to police our intuitive, you know. Uh, yes. 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 Yes, but for definitely it doesn't matter because probability is not in the world. So you just have to be uncertain about something. It might not even exist. But uh, why am I not allowed to say when certain folks stop and I find out I have to use the police and the satisfaction of Okay, yeah, I mean, you can have this view, and some people have this view, but it's the minority, actually, among the philosophers. I think that people think that uh, is to have probability is to be rational, and if you don't have probability, it means that you are incoherent. You know, it's like saying, you ask me, what's the probability of rain raining now? I say 50%. You ask me, what's the probability of not raining? I say 60%. Um, that's, that's being incoherent. This is a fact that if I pick a date 500 years, right? Yes. Yeah. Like, matter about whether it's raining or not. No, but I mean, you can be ignorant about it. I mean, you don't know anything now, but you can be ignorant about it. You can bet on it. And uh, I mean, anyway, uh, I mean, I'm not going as extreme as economics. Yeah. Maybe your point is that you might not have a probability of starting a period. It's nothing to do with whether this event actually occurred. Yes. So your example, you're giving an example of an implicit probability of starting a new presupposition. Yes. Well, but if, if you look at the subjectivist, and I think that it's fair to say that it's a common view, is they always think that there is a probability. It might not be a probability that is based on some good you know, grounds, but there is always probability. Now, one of the things that I would try to suggest is that Definetti thought otherwise. That they are not always, pro although he was subjectivist, he didn't think that there are always probability, but the question is why. But, but anyway, uh, I think that talking about economics is a bit far-fetched because uh, I don't think that it's realistic, I mean, to think any way along the economy. At about the same time, yeah. uh, in, in a related field, people are making formally analogous Yes, yes. I mean, basically, the, the founding fathers, I think that uh, what uh, uh, von Neumann and Morgenstern did, I mean, uh, they did something that Ramsey did before, but, maybe, you know, more sophisticated in some sense, but without, I think without knowing maybe, I mean, but, but Renzi already did it and, and definitely to some extent, yeah. Okay, so, um, so now assuming that all the, all you, all the things that you are ignorant about, I mean, are represented by one probability function is basically ass assuming that there is a joint distribution over these things. Um, 
and uh, and and so so basically now I think uh, um, I can now I can uh, I can introduce some in the worry that uh, Itamar Pitovsky had. Now, if followers of the subjective interpretation were committed to the assumption that there is such a joint group so, uh, distribution, and if Arthur Fahn was right in his interpretation of Bell's theorem, it would follow from that that uh, uh, anybody who, anyone who follows, I mean, this interpretation would be committed to the Bell, Clausen, and Norm inequalities that I'm going to present in a moment, and therefore would never get the probabilities of quantum mechanics. So what you're saying basically that, that the joint distribution is, I mean, doesn't explain Bell, Bell's theorem. Because joint distribution is what thing, so the Boy Bowman over yeah. But but the Bell's theorem is not about these things. The Bell's theorem is about measurement outcomes. If if you are if you have a joint probability of a joint probability over everything, the right. hidden variable and the measurement outcome. Well, well, measurement outcomes. I mean, you can think about it where the particle went in the Stern girler. That's enough. And there will be joint. If you assume joint, if you assume that the joint distribution, that that I mean that the agent has joint distribution and use the subjective probability, then 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 you will get in any theory whatsoever. I mean, it's it's a theorem of probability theory that you will get. I mean, the, something like. But maybe you have to. Maybe you look at it in the context of Okay, I, I'll talk about it. I mean, I'm running really late. I mean, it's like 25 minutes, and I'm not even halfway through. So, uh, more than yeah. Um, so I will talk about it when I. So is it clear? I mean, what is the 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 challenge? So that was the challenge. I mean, it's not about the, the and, and I think that it's an interesting subject, a challenge, and I think one has to take it seriously because in my view, Itamar is one of the, you know, one of the experts on probability in quantum mechanics. I mean, if there is, I mean, if, if I know anything about this, I learned from him. Um, okay. So um, now, follower of the subjective probability may agree with fine, with how to find that that uh, Bell's theorem is not about uh, non-locality, it's about probability, but for somehow decline, I mean, to assume that there is a joint distribution over all the, uh, you know, all, over all the things that they are uncertain about. Uh, but the question is, is whether they have a non-ad hoc reason to do that. I will argue that, that if you follow the phonetic, there is a non-ad hoc, independently of what you think about what find, you know. But, 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 but before getting to this issue, I want actually to analyze quickly uh, uh, Arthur Fine's uh, work and, and to show that I think uh, he's wrong, in my view. Okay, so that's the second. Um, okay, um, the term bearing quality is ambiguous. I mean, I can think at least about three different kinds of, uh, and I'm talking about Bell, Clausen, and Norin inequality. So, uh, the notation, lambda is the, uh, the hidden variable, I mean, the, the complete state of the particle pair in the EPR. A, B, A prime, A, A, A prime are the spin in two different directions of the left particle, and B and B prime are the spin uh, in two, dif two different directions of the right particle before the, before the measurements. Uh, these are the hidden variables. And, uh, and the OA is the outcome up in the A direction on a spin measurement. Um, and, and the same for OB or A prime and OB prime. A and B are the direction of the measurement, the setting of the measurement apparatus to measure spin in direction A and B in the direction B. Is it clear the notation? But the difference yes, the difference is that this is uh, the model probability, the lambda. The lambda is the model probability, and the psi is the quantum probability. So these are these are about outcomes. These are actually closer to uh, what we should call, I mean, Bell, Bell Clausen or non or Bell inequalities. 
And this is a kind of strange, but I think that uh, I will have explanation why this is also called, I mean, uh, bell clauser and non inequality, but you can see the structural similarity. Anyway, uh, the, the, the news from probability theory that this is a theorem of probability theory. Whatever A, B, A prime and B prime is, and whatever P is, uh, this, any, anything that is probability has to satisfy that. It's a mathematical result. And uh, uh, so if you have a joint probability over A, A prime, B and B prime, uh, in a probability function, you will get this. It's interesting that it was actually discovered by a physicist, but it's, 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 it's nothing to do with physics. Um, uh, these two are not theorems of probability theory. Okay? And they don't follow from any assumption of joint distribution. And look at my notation. I mean, I wrote conditional probability with subscripts rather than under, uh, after the uh, conditionalization stock. And I think to make it explicit that in these inequalities, there are six different probability functions. So there is no point in talking even about you know, uh, distribution in one function. From distribution in one function, you don't get anything. So R2 fine has to convince us that this can follow from a joint distribution, because this is the relevant for the experiment. At the end of the day, whatever comes before is irrelevant. And, and obviously, I mean, you can see now that it's impossible to do that without assuming some physical assumption. For instance, assuming that B, uh, uh, P uh, lambda AB is equal to, to, this, uh, to this probability. If you assume for each of these probability, then, then you can use, uh, then you can use probability theory and you need actually another assumption. You need also the lambda independence. Uh, you can go from this this inequality of probability theory to this inequality. But otherwise, you cannot do that. OK? Um, is that clear, the general? I mean, if we want, we can talk more about it. So let me say just uh, quickly. So that's what I said. Um, the first one is probability theory. Um, the second one, um, OK. Now, as, as I mentioned, uh, Bell. Uh, derive this assumption, this, this inequality, not by joint distribution. He derived it by assuming factorizability and lambda independence, the locality condition. And both of these conditions do not assume joint probability. So you can see that it's not a necessary condition, joint probability, to get this uh, inequality. That is not sufficient condition. It's easy because I can build a model. And in the paper that I sent you, there is a model, I mean, very simple model in which you you have a joint probability that, that violates this. Um, so they chose that is not sufficient condition. Anyway, so um, now sometimes there is the temptation, and, and I added this because there was in some of the talks, to say, OK, if you put after the conditionalization stroke, I mean, if you put everything that was in the subscript into the probability function to, to probability space, then you have one probability uh, uh, function over everything. Uh, that's true, but the bad news for those who think that it's probability theory, that this is not a theorem of probability theory, nevertheless. Um, you need unconditional probability to have, a, I mean, to derive it. So I think that uh, if we want to talk about it more, we can talk later, but I think we can, I mean, put aside, I mean, the, uh, uh, how to find worry. I mean, I just want to uh, to point out that uh, uh, one can get from, as I, as I already hinted, one can get from this uh, inequality, which is an assumption about joint distribution, to this inequality by two assumptions. One is that I call it mirror, that the distribution of outcome reflect the distribution of the, uh, of the spin before the measurement. So they mirror them for whatever reason. And the other one is that the distribution of the lambda is independent on the measurement apparatus, the lambda independence. Once you assume that, you can go from here to here. But these are two physical assumptions. And they are not unrelated to causality and non-locality. OK. And they're actually violated. So if you want, 
uh, to Lucian, uh, you can think about A and B here as the position of the particle in Bohm's theory uh, relative to the measurement apparatus. And, and in Bohm's theory, it does satisfy this assumption. If you think it is. But, but Bohm's theory violates the mirror assumption. Okay? So that's the. Uh, okay. So if it's okay, I must really rush into the finetti. <laughs> and so leave quantum mechanics for a moment and go to the Finetti and uh, uh, try to uh, make my first ID. And, and, and the first ID, just to, um, the main ID of, that I had in the paper, uh, in, in this paper a long time ago, um, is that uh, uh, that coherence of, on the Finetti is actually much more complicated than people think. And coherence depends on some ver verificationalism. Uh, so, to be coherent is not just to be coherent in this, in, in, to be consistent. It, it really embodies some, some assumption about uh, uh, verificationalism. Now, one of the things that I will try to convince you that in his theory, verificationism makes a very good sense, actually the best sense, if you're subjectivist uh, uh, on his view. So he was positivist, but I think that uh, you can give a very good and straightforward uh, justification uh, even if you're not positive. Okay, so uh, the Finetti is very different from, I studied probability theory as a measure theory. So the first uh, meeting, I mean, there was the assistant gave us like, uh, so there was a lecture and then there were the tutorial and the, the, in the tutorial in order to make it spicy, and some paradox about, uh, you know, probability. And, uh, uh, and, and then immediately we, uh, after this paradox, we never thought about anything intuitive or non-intuitive. It was just a measure theory. So it doesn't matter whether you talk about probability or you talk about the length of tables. I mean, it's, it's basically the same. You just normalize. Uh, the Finetti has a very different view. So the Finetti, the axioms of probability theory, is very different from, from Kolmogorov. Uh, the axiom of probability theory have to follow from the notion of probability, the axioms and theorems. You cannot just postulate them. They have to follow from the notion. So that's very important. And as we should see, and that's the reason why he doesn't define, for instance, conditional probability just as a ratio. He actually derived it uh, from his probability theory. The second thing that is important is that probability are inherently subjective. And, and probability is nothing about the world. It's just, uh, it's just an expression. Degrees of belief are expression of uncertainty and probabilities is just making these degrees of belief coherent. So it's nothing to do uh, with the world, and it's not supposed to. I mean, a lot of, uh, a, a lot of less extreme subjectivists, uh, like, for instance, if you in the philosophy, I mean, literature, David Lewis, would say subjective probability is supposed to be a guess about objective probability. So he has these... Uh, principle is called the principal principle in which if, you, if the probability, your subjective probability of A given that uh, you believe or assume that the chance of A is half should be half. So definitely that doesn't make sense. You don't have objective probability and you cannot have such conditional probability and you cannot have such a principle. It's all subjective. Uh, now, uh, what is important is that, so just to see, uh, so any probabilistic reasoning is uh, uh, always, always subjective, and, uh, uh, and it doesn't matter why, I mean, you are uncertain, it's because of uncertainty. Um, the other thing is that this is, that probability is, uh, it's an instrumental view. So his view is that probability is an instrument, uh, is a guide for life, but it's only instrumental, not because it reflects anything in the world, because he thinks and he wants to convince us that it's a good instrument to police your ignorance. That's the best way to police your ignorance. And, and, and therefore, it doesn't matter wh whether, I mean, the world is deterministic or indeterministic, uh, whether you exist or don't, I mean, you know, whether you are brain in a vet or whatever. It's it really all this question, like in instrumental, if you have an instrumental interpretation of a theory, these things, I mean, are not relevant at all. Okay. Okay, um, and, and, and there is no fact in the world 
that could show that your probability is not right. I mean, at, at most, what facts could do is convince you, but psychologically, to change your mind about probability. But this is psychological. It's always go through your subjective, I mean, reasoning. There is no mechanical rule. Some of the Bayesians are looking for mechanical rules, but for definitely that was really not the thing to do. Okay, now the important, I mean, to get from this very subjective view, uh, the probability theory, uh, you have to impose, and that's the minimal rationality condition, and for him is actually uh, the, the most important and the only one, is that degrees of beliefs are coherent. And the, the, the usual argument is that you say, if you're not coherent, I can sell you a Dutch book. And a Dutch book is a bet in which you lose come what may if you're incoherent. So yeah, just offer you, I mean, according to uh, the bets that you take as fair. Uh, so suppose like uh, uh, you, your degree of belief in raining now is 50% and your degree of belief in not raining is 60%. Um, I give you a series of bets in which, whether it's raining or not, I mean, you're going to lose come what may. So that's the point. So if you don't want to be in such a situation as Dutch book, um, you have to be coherent. In economics, I mean, it's sometimes called the uh, pumping money out of you. Yeah, but I, I think But for definitely, you bet all the time. Whenever you cross the street, you bet in some sense because you know you have degree of belief that, I mean, that the car comes or, yeah, yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I have the same sympathies as you, I mean, but I think that, I think it does make sense when you talk about the EPR, for instance, you know, but things are clear, the EPR experiments, and, and you know exactly what you're betting, and you can measure it, uh, you know, in five minutes from now, or maybe a year. Um, so when things are very, yeah, so that's enough for me. Yeah, yeah, but, yes. I agree. I mean, I have also, that's the reason why I'm not Bayesian. But still, I think it's important to understand what Definetti says. Because I think that what he says goes beyond Bayesian. That's, that, that, that's the important thing. OK, so that's the coherence. Um, now, Definetti also thought that it's very important to be able to measure degree of belief, given that they're so central. Um, a, and, uh, uh, and given that they are like guide for life. I mean, they're basically the guide for life. And, and a number of uh, uh, philosophers of uh, probability or founding fathers of different interpretations are the same. Um, okay, now, the, the Dutch book uh, framework uh, is a bit problematic because there is a, a, there is a bookie and there is an interaction between two people and, and there might be the temptation I mean, to change your mind and not to reveal you true degrees of belief because of that. So definitely, actually, uh, uh, although many people talk about the, uh, the Dutch book argument, he used them in a different framework. Um, and I'll just say it, I mean, uh, very uh, quickly talk about it. It's called the loss function. And the idea is that uh, there is no bookie. You have your degrees of belief, but you are subjected to a certain loss function. Uh, according to the difference between your degree of belief and whether the events that you bet on or, or you know, have degrees of belief in uh, uh, ha or happen or, or they don't happen. If they happen, um, the e EI is, is like a variable for these uh, uh, events, and if they happen, is one, and if they don't happen, is zero. And, 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 and the idea is that uh, uh, if you're rational, you don't want to take any decision or any degrees of belief that would be dominated by other degrees of belief. So you want to be in a situation in which your loss is, is not always more than it should be, come what may. Okay, so it's, it's similar to the Dutch book. I mean, it's similar to the Dutch book, but there is no bookie and there is no betting. 
you like bet against nature if you want. I mean, you know, you said, I mean, you don't want to enter. You, you like, I mean, you want to live and you always think about what should I do and, and, and accordingly. But anyway, I mean, it's not so important. I mean, in the paper is a bit more important for the probability theory, but, but just uh, uh, I will talk about it uh, later. Okay. Now, another thing that is important for definite is to have an operational definition of probability so that you derive probability um, in, in, in operational terms. But, but the operationality here, I mean, is very important to emphasize is not operationality a la Bridgman that you know. You define like probability in terms of operation or you define temperature. What he means is basically that you should have uh, some criterion about probability, I mean, a definition that will allow for a criterion for measurements of probability. Okay. Um, okay, the last thing uh, about probability before I go um, to talk about another important element of, uh, of definity and then uh, to quantum mechanics, back to quantum mechanics, is that uh, conditional probability is usually defined as a ratio. So the probability of A given B is the probability of A and B divided by the probability of B. For definitely, that's not true. Uh, for the definitely probability, conditional probability is the probability um, that you, uh, you have, the degree of belief that you have in A uh, if you come to know B, if you come to know, assume, or believe B. But that's not a ratio. I mean, it's something, it's actually a primitive, if you want, it could be understood in two ways. One as a conditional. For instance, when you say the probability of A given B is X or 0.5, it's like saying if A, then my probability of B would be 0.5, which is different. It, it, it doesn't always imply actually the ratio. It's only in certain situation imply the ratio definition as a coherent condition. Okay, so that's one thing. Another way, uh, Another way that definitely, so that's, the, that's this way. So one way, I mean, to say um, is like the conditional probability of uh, E, uh, that the, the probability of E given H is equal P, is to say that if I come to know be, or believe or assume H, then my probability of E would be P. And you can also use it as a counterfactual. I mean, suppose that uh, H is just a, a counterfactual background knowledge, so I say. Uh, uh, if I if I had known or believed H, then my probability in E would have been P. Okay, so that's it's one yes, yes, but it's not counterfactual. I mean, this uh, yeah, I mean it's more complicated. In the paper, I develop a little bit more uh, these things, but the point is that it's not. It's a kind of conditional. Uh, another way that uh, Definetti actually uh, uh, played with, I mean, an ID is conditional events. So when you talk about the probability of E given H, it's like the unconditional prob probability of a conditional event, E conditional on H, which is basically a conditional proposition. Is the proposition if H uh, is true, then uh, uh, so, so, so this conditional event is not a binary event. It's not true or false. It could be also indeterminate. So the idea is that uh, uh, if H is true, then, then the conditional event H A, A, E given H, depends on whether E is true. If it's true, then it's true. If E is false, it's false. But if H is false, then the, this conditional event is indeterminate or void. If you want, I mean, those of you who know about the uh, call of bet, that's basically the idea of uh, call of bet. And, and, and basically, it leads to a, a tree-value logic and, and a probability theory over tree-value logic. So it's already non-classical. But also, in the first way, it's non-classical, but uh, it's more difficult to see. Um, so what I try to show here that, 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 is, is that, that his theory is, in some sense, already non-classical. OK? Is it clear? I need another 10 minutes or so, if it's OK. OK. Yeah, it's, it's a bit long. Okay, so um, now there are different, these two ways of thinking about pro uh, conditional probability are different. Uh, interestingly, they're based, both of them are suggested in the text of Definetti, and in the eye of Definetti, they're actually very close to, 
And so that's a, a quotation from his book, uh, its theory of probability, two volumes, uh, or published in 1970 uh, in Italian and then translated to English 1974. So we shall write the probability of the event uh, uh, conditional, uh, the event E should be the conditional on H, or even the probability of the conditional event EH, um, which is the probability that you attribute to E should be there, if you, if in addition to your present information, which is usually suppressed, uh, I, which we understand implicitly, it will become known to you uh, that it is true, that H is true and nothing else. Sorry, I mean, I don't know where the H, yeah, that, pardon? No, no, that H is true, because they, it's a conditional probability. It's the probability of E uh, uh, if you it becomes known to you or you assume H in addition to your implicit background that you just suppressed. Okay, so you can see that there is the conditional here, but on the other hand, he says, well, it's the same as talking about conditional events, and he has a long discussion in which he talks about Reichenbach free, uh, free value logic in the context of quantum mechanics and. And, and also other people who developed, I mean, a tree value logic and try to have a probability theory over there. Okay, so now to the punchline about probability in the Finetti. Um, he says, the Finetti, for the Finetti, it's very important that you can verify the events. He wants to give probability only to events that are verifiable. Um, I, and otherwise, it's not, the, I mean, there are no probabilities, basically. And I'll try to very briefly to explain why, why it makes sense in his view. Uh, but, but basically, he it says it's always a question of examining uh, if and in what sense a statement really constitutes an event permitting in a more or less restrict, uh, a realistic, acceptable form and in a unique way the verification of whether it's true or false. Now, um, it's interesting to make a distinction. The Finetti is not subjectivist about events. He's subjectivist about probabilities. He's actually pretty realist about, uh, he's a positivist, so he doesn't want to talk about things that have no meaning or you, know, you cannot verify. But uh, I would suggest that, that actually it's important, although he's realist about events, it's important to have uh, verifiable events for probability. Okay, now, he, he acknowledged that referability, I mean, is kind of complicated and vague, um, and he doesn't discuss it. Um, now, for, uh, he took pragmatic attitude about, you know, what is verifiable or not. Uh, what I'm going to do, I just assume verifiability in principle in order to make things simple. Otherwise, it's, it's too difficult. Okay. So he says, and that's a quotation from this book, uh, it should be in English, it's 1974, uh, A, B are event observable, but it is not possible to observe both of them, and therefore it is in, it's not possible to, to call the product A, B an event. Okay, so you can, have a pro, uh, you can have an event A, you can have an event B, but A, B is not an event, at least for probability theory. Um, okay, so, um, now, he's not saying that the event doesn't exist in the world. But, but what he's saying, basically, I'll give probabilities only to things that are verifiable. Um, okay, motivation. Uh, one thing is that is a positivist motivation. He thought that, you know, if you cannot verify, it could be just metaphysical notion of event. And then, you know, you may talk about nonsense, but think that it may make sense. The other one is that he thought that all notions that have a, a great practical importance have to be, a, a be able to be measured. And, and, and therefore, they have to be verifiable in one way or another. And that event and probability are, are examples. Um, but four and five are the most important things. Remember, the Finetti is extremely subjectivist and instrumentalist about probability. Probability doesn't exist. I mean, you shouldn't ever think about whether you are right or not about probability, because it doesn't make sense. Now think about, in this context, uh, how do you make for a degrees of belief coherent? If you take the Dutch book, that's the easy framework. 
you have a Dutch book and you want to convince me to be coherent. And you say, let's bet on event A and know that event A is unverifiable. Okay, I said the probability is minus 0.2. Now show me that I'm not coherent. And you cannot, I mean, conclude this bet, no? So it doesn't make sense. It, it's basically the idea of coherence, given that coherence is uh, defined in a, a, in, in a decision theoretic framework, certain type, it doesn't make sense to talk about bets uh, uh, that are, or, or decisions in, in that framework that are not, uh, uh, that you cannot conclude. Now, the other loss function uh, seems to suggest otherwise because you can think, have losses, I mean, even if you cannot verify because there is no bet. But, but a little reflection would show that it's the same because I shouldn't worry about any loss and, 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 and being coherent if, if it's something that I will never verify. I mean, the point is that to be instrumental, it makes sense, probability can be, if probability is subjective, it could be instrumental only if you can verify, at least in principle, the thing that you have probability of. If you cannot verify the implication of your degree of belief, you know, few action decisions, then, then it's not going to be tool for guidance for life. So I think that in the finitist, uh, a, a system, it does make a very good sense if you want to do, uh, if you want to have probability to, to require a verification reason. And it doesn't mean that you cannot have degrees of belief, but degrees of beliefs are not probabilities. Probabilities are coherent degrees of beliefs. And, and you cannot, I mean, if you want, there is more in the paper uh, uh, explanation, but uh, uh, basically the idea is that uh, you cannot make a good sense of coherence in, in unverifiable events um, in this framework, in this philosophy. Okay? Um, now, there are two ways to make it explicit, and by conditional. Yeah? Um, Um, he's subjectivist all the way. So you have an assumption, you have a background assumption that tells you, I mean, this is your subjective background assumption. There is nothing beyond that. So you have, according to like, suppose uh, in quantum mechanics, suppose I don't know quantum mechanics, but you tell me, and I'm convinced that you cannot measure spin in two different directions on the same particle at the same time. So I put it in my background knowledge. And then I, I say, well, I cannot measure spin X and Y on the particle at the same time. I cannot verify them. Therefore, there is a joint, no joint probability of the two. I might have to believe somewhere on the closest A joint probability of in connection with those degrees of belief. So degrees of belief you can have. Degrees of beliefs are not probabilities. Probabilities are trying to make that distinction. Yes. I'm just trying to get clear about what that is. Yeah. I mean, probabilities are only of verifiable event, and, and, and it's always a matter, all probabilities are conditional. They're always conditional on your background knowledge or assumptions. And your background assumption w would tell you, I mean, you know, or, uh, whether it's verifiable or not. Now, you might be mistaken, but that's irrelevant. Uh, then you can change your background. Okay, so there are two ways, I mean, uh, but both of them are by conditional probability. Basically, what Definetti says, if you take the, remember, we can, we can talk about conditional probability either three uh, conditional events with three values or as a, a, a certain kind of conditional. So if you think about conditional events, you can say instead of giving probabilities or degrees of belief to events, you give probability uh, or degrees of belief always to event conditional on their observation, or at least conditional on that they can be verifiable, okay? So then you can have probability of uh, the conditional event E1 conditional on H1, and you can have probability of uh, uh, the event E2 conditional on H2, but you might not have probability of E12, which is the co conjunction of E1 and E2, 
uh, conditional on H12. So that means that if you go this way, you have a probability theory, or your space of event have all these atomic events, but some of them have no joint probability. So you have a space of probability with holes, basically, which you can see it's already non-classical in that sense. Um, or you can, um, okay, so that's what I say. Or, hmm, one of them actually disappeared. Um, hmm. Okay. Um, the other way is is to, to do the following. Uh, the other way. Let me see. Um, okay. The, the other way that that somehow disappeared here. I don't know why. It's transparency that I lost. Um, is to think about uh, uh, to think about in a different way. To to have uh, to have your degrees of belief represented by. Uh, smaller probability spaces, each of which uh, is such that all the events in it are jointly verifiable. And if you want, uh, that's what I did when I wrote the probability with the subscript. That basically each subscript uh, could identify probability space, and each subscript assume implicitly that, I mean, or if you want, there is an assumption there, the condition HI, uh, that uh, uh, that uh, the, 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 the all the events in this uh, uh, probability, smaller probability space, are jointly verifiable, and that's just a classical probability space. But then the idea is that your ignorance, general ignorance, is uh, is uh, uh, is divided into different probability spaces that need not have close, I mean, very close connection to each other. Okay. So, so that's the. But either way, either way, if you go back to the um, to the Clausen and on uh, inequality, and you talk about the spin, remember a, b, a prime, and b prime are spins in different direction. Uh, you don't get this probability inequality because uh, if you go with the three events, um, then you don't have joint probability of a, b, a prime, and b prime because they are not jointly verifiable. So in your probability space, there is a hole, and then you cannot derive this. If you have a hole, you cannot derive this uh, inequality. If you go the other way, uh, you will have here uh, four different probability spaces, one for A and B, one for A prime and B, the other one from A and B prime, and the other one for A prime and B prime, and they will be separated. They won't constrain each other. So again, you will have Basically, what you are going to have, the coherent condition are going to be weaker. And, and, and because they are weaker, you have more flexibility with your probabilities. I mean, you can do more. Um, so, so basically, yeah, it's, uh, I have. I, I it's not their question, so. Yeah, yes, I mean, I, I have just a conclusion. So, um, okay. Um, one thing. It's three short points. I mean, one is, is an interesting point that's actually connected to objective probability. So, I thought that. Uh, so one point is that it's actually this kind of verificationalism seems to make sense even if you're not subjective. It's a kind of give you extra cushion. You know, if you don't know what's going on, um, uh, you, if you cannot verify, don't give joint probability to something. Um, and that, that immediately make your probability space different, non-classical in some sense. Um, so that's one point. The second point is actually interesting with someone who had the view, George Bull, and that's a paper uh, that uh, Itamar published in 1994, Itamar Pitovsky. Uh, 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 George Bull, I mean, was, he's known more for logic, but actually he had the important contribution to foundation of probability. And he had the idea, uh, the notion that is called a condition of possible experience. Now, he talked about probability as a, a relative frequency in finite samples. So it's an objective probability. But, he, but his uh, condition of possible experience is basically the coherence condition that we usually think about. But they only apply in a sample 
that you can, uh, uh, in one sample, in things that you can uh, sample jointly. So, so it's basically similar to what I said about uh, Definetti. If you cannot sample four events, I mean jointly, then the condition, the normal condition, co the coherence condition would not, uh, uh, would not apply. Okay, so I think that uh, it's nicely, I mean, and, and that's, you know, 60 years before Definetti. And um, th the last thing is that actually, if you take the Definetti as uh, the basis for your interpretation of quantum probabilities, uh, then it's difficult to prove, uh, it's difficult to, uh, uh, to argue for non-locality for two reasons. One is that if you have subjective probabilities, factorizability, remember the condition that the probability of joint outcome factorized, is very difficult to connect to causality because these probabilities are just extremely subjectivist. They're nothing to do with any causation or, or um, and the other thing is that in, the, in lambda independence, the hidden variable is usually not verifiable in theories. It's actually the minority of hidden variable theory that you'll find uh, that they're verifiable. Now, if they're not verifiable, you cannot give probability to lambda. And if you, don't, if you cannot give probability to lambda, you cannot even formulate lambda independence. So you cannot actually prove the, derive the inequality. So in a sense, in the context of definite, it's very difficult to do the exercise that Bell did. Now, that shouldn't be surprising because if you are extremely subjective, if your probability should not reflect anything about causality or non-locality. So that's the end. Thanks. Sorry for being too long. <laughs>
system if you constantly you can't get a bell button, then, that's then, just then, then that's there's a problem. Um, and you, what you're talking about is something which in the future is disappearing. Sure. You, you're talking about a class of theories where quantum theory is, is not. Right. Well, because, because the fact that on the fact on the outcome the quantum theory A isn't correct, and B there will be experiments in the future that allow me to measure the values of pin variables. Which we have not yet invented. Why? I mean, why am I not allowed to have to try to make coherent my degrees of belief about future? But, but you're no, you're saying. I mean, I, I you're not saying it's Bell's theorem. theorem. Bell's theorem is a theorem about quantum theory. Rather than about some future theory. Well, theorem about quantum theory. Yeah, but it's not about. But my point is, uh, I mean, definitely would not say that you know you cannot have a, a bet about what happened 500 years from now because someone may be able to measure it. So it's very fine, at least in principle. But if you are in equilibrium, then it seems that you cannot measure. I mean, this in principle you cannot measure the hidden variable. Now, if if you are out of equilibrium. Then there are other things you can give, for instance, signal, or I mean, right. you can have some other information that would let you know at least indirectly. I mean, where where you are. So it's a different situation. But I mean, yeah. I mean, following what uh, Lucian said, I mean, in most I think uh, hidden bubble theories of uh, quantum mechanics, it turns out that the lambda is something that you cannot verify. Um, as opposed to, can I can I ask you? As opposed to ordinary quantum mechanics, where you can verify that you have, so you, your only lambda just is the wave function of the quantum yeah. state. And you, so the view that in that case you can, but in a hidden variable theory you can't, or is that in both cases you really you don't have direct access to the state? Well, if you if you cannot, I mean, if if your view is that you cannot, I mean, verify also the quantum state, then it's even worse. I mean, in some okay. sense, but. But definitely is not worried about it. I mean, the, the last point that I said, I mean, it should be surprising because probability is not about ontological things. It's just about policing your ignorance. So it, it's completely neutral with respect to, you know, what would be the ontology and, and whatever. So definitely could, as a realist about the event, could believe in non-locality, for instance. But it's, when he talks about probability, it's a different issue. Is verifiability understood um, subjectively in the sense that um, for you to have probabilities, uh, you have to regard something as verifiable rather than there being verifiable? Yes. Because okay. the basis is always uh, subjective. So for the finite, even symmetry is subjective. It's, it's subjective. That's the reason why changeability is the main notion. So. It's always, I mean, it's, you know, you tell me that the physical the structure of the coin, that's irrelevant. I mean, it's, it's always, I mean, <laughs> given your subjective symmetry, which is reflected in achievability or, or partial, you have your judgment. So is, is verifiability coming in in two different ways? I'm thinking about those holes in the probability space where E12, H12 don't exist. Yes. Now that can be because uh, the the joint event is not verifiable. Yes. Or could it also be because maybe the joint event is verifiable, it's observational, but the joint probability is not verifiable? No, is the probability the... could not be verifiable because probability are not in the world. Okay. It's just probability, just opinion. You so know, think about okay. it as a subjective, so totally subjective okay. opinion. Okay. So the verification comes through the the events. Yes. Yes, because uh, because probability there is no meaning to say you know probability is true or false, except for saying that your true degree of belief is is something, and that's your psychological state. I have a question concerning your second point there. Yeah. I wonder whether even within no, sorry, I'm not on the slide before. No, sorry, the last slide. The number. Ah, the last slide. Ah, okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it seems to me there is a way to motivate factorizability within a subjective probability, meaning some kind of coherence between background beliefs about causation and your probability assignments. So if you have certain standard beliefs about causation, it seems to me that you will be constrained in the sorts of probabilities you assign. So for example, um, you know, if there are three events, A, B, and C, and then I think that you know, C is the common cause of A and B, then it seems to me the probability is I assigned to them should be such that A and B are conditionally independent given C. 
And if A and B are not conditionally dependent given C, then haven't I violated this uh, background assumption that C is the cause of A and B? Hey, it sounds very intuitive, and I would probably do the same, but, uh, but, but, but you are implicitly assuming that there is something in your non probabilistic beliefs that reflect on the probabilistic belief and constrain that, no? Yeah. And that's exactly what the fact tells you not to do. I mean, you know, you can do it psychologically and it's okay, but then under reflection and criticism, the question is whether it stands. I mean, so you're right. I mean, probably also the phonetic would do that. But, uh, but that doesn't mean that it really justifies motivating the sense of justifying the main uh, factors ability as a uh, locality condition. Because at the end of the day, your probabilities are not supposed to reflect anything in the world. Frequency is not probability, for instance. It's not. I, mean, but I, I could assign a probability to a particular causal structure. I could say, my yeah. opinion of causal structure yeah. is this. Yeah. And then I would have to have coherence between my opinions about causal structure and my opinions about these three events. So could, couldn't I have a coherence argument that would get me to fact probability in that sort of way? I mean, if you can give a dash proof, then yes. Yeah. I, can show I think you that might be the answer. Might be. If you can, yeah, if you can, if you can show me that a situation in which there is a Dutch book, um, then yeah. But it can never verify the causal structures. Pardon? But the, the causal structures that it first has some beliefs about would yeah. not be probabilities in this terms since they are not verified. Um, they are not events. Yeah, well, it depends what you think about what is a causal structure. <laughs> I mean, that's an ambiguous. I mean, uh, if you think uh, normally as philosophers think like architecture or all these things, it's probably not. Yeah. Yeah, I'm very confused by your, your answer. I mean, every time you apply these conditions of coherence include normalization of probabilities. And that assumes you, you have given a list of possible exclusive outcomes. And your use of that condition assumes that you are confident that your list of exclusive outcomes is correct. And that you, and of course, that could always be incorrect. It could have yes. so, so you could always make a critique of, you know, how do you know that where that is, something else comes, you know, down the light cone and smashes your experiment or comes into your experiment or something like that. So there's always, in your background assumptions, there's always physical assumptions that, that tell you that you're confident that you have a complete list of exclusive outcomes. So if you allow that, if you don't allow that, you can't do, even on these terms, any specification of probabilities or coherence. And once you allow that, why don't you allow what Rob says he wants to allow? Yeah. Well, I have to think again about this. this the, the, I mean, the, the second paragraph. I think uh, it's easier to argue uh, against lambda independence, but more, I can see that it's more tricky. But it's even true that you can't verify uh, the variables in a bubble. So, 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 so take, take the double space experiment, for example. Mm -hmm. so you have a um, you have some particles impinging on a on a bubble so one at a time, each pair in the same state. You know the state you can calculate because you know the preparation state. Um, and then the particles go through and then they get a screen at the back. And you can measure directly what the positions of the particles are. So um, so so at any given time you know both the distribution of particles. You can use the equations you know, or just at that time measure them. And you also know what the quantum state is. Um, um, so I think you can, if you if you believe the Bowman interpretation, and I think for, for an ensemble of systems, you can actually measure both, so they are verifiable. Of course, you have to believe the interpretation. Okay. Well, they're often criticized as calling these hidden variables hidden. Yeah. Because in a sense, um, the past positions act as the things you measure, those are the things you you can measure, you can measure, but then um, can you can you also verify the states? I mean, you're saying, I mean, the following, you're saying, uh, um, I prepare the state so I know what the state is. Yeah. And you're but you, you need to free. verify, you know, the preparation is, is some, like what we call some causal action or something, you manipulate something. 
you need to be verify to be, to verify it. And I'm not sure that you can verify if you want to verify what some quantum state is, um, you have to make some measurement. Uh, that's the minimum. Um. And then if you make such a measurement. If you want to measure the position, for instance, you, you change the quantum state. If you if you make some measurement that will give you some idea about the quantum state, you might change the but position. But I was saying just before, just immediately before the particle hit the screen. Yeah. Um, I, I know the particles don't move too fast, so I know where they were. If they hit the screen at some point, I know where they were just an instant before. Okay. And I know also the quantum state, so I can see by calculation where they will move from that state. Yeah. I don't um, know yeah. You know, I have to think about it again. I mean, I suppose that the problem is that verif verification, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, verification is kind of ambiguous, as I said, and, and the kinetic because it's, it's not only instrumentalist and subjectivist, it's also pragmatic. Right. Pragmatist, so it, it doesn't care. I mean, for him, at the end of the day, he can work with it. I mean, it's, it's, it's not philosophical at that point. So I suppose that at the end of the day, I mean, it really depends how you verify things and if you are if if you are uh, you know like back about it I suppose that you can do it. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm a little lost because um, it seems to be con um, this confusion you say that verifiability is it's just you know part of, of, of the probability theory but then we're talking about making measurements and doing real things yes so uh, is, is there some sort of Correspondence between those. I mean, can I think of verifiability as suppose I'm I'm reasoning about um, the conjunction of, of two events. It, can verifiability just be thought of as some some belief that I have that these two events are mutually exclusive? Therefore, to be coherent, I have to assign zero probability to that conjunction. Um. I think what he means by probability that you have some procedure uh, um, that would allow you to verify whether you know you believe it's true or, not, or false. So it's something you could do to convince yourself that yes, this was yes. okay. But you mean like to decide whether you're so it's not the assignment is it's, it's not just observation. It's, just, it's not just observation. For instance, the example that uh, Lucian gave about the particle. If it's good for you as a measurement verification that if, that if you see the particle hitting the screen at a certain point, then it means that he was very close to this point before, then it is, uh, you verify it. By looking at the screen, you verify it. I mean, the, the, you know, the, the hypothesis that the particle was just on the trajectory near the screen before and not came from, you know, um, I don't know, minus infinity. Um, so that's a... a so, so that sort of things. I mean, it's a, uh, but but it's an ambiguous notion. Also, this the uh, lambda independence. Um, there, there's the uh, loop of mana here. This is not your knowledge. And you just came back into the day. Um, it, 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 I think I, I do the character design, but I don't want to put words in his mouth. Um, that. If you assume determinism, then this, this assumption of uh, lambda independence is just simply a logical contradiction. Um, because you're, in, in general, knowing the detector settings and the outcomes should give you information about, about lambda. There's, there's, no, there's no logical reason to assume that somehow that probability, those two probability distributions are equal, the one where you just ignore that information and the one where you keep it. I think that's, uh, I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, I think that this claim is controversial because, for instance, uh, Bell, who, I mean, had Bohm's theory in mind, thought that he can still talk about lambda independence and it's not a, a contradiction. He talked about the situation in which you have super determinism. Uh, well, certainly, if you had this idea of super determinism, yeah. then that would imply that there's this independence. But that, that's only no, it's one it's no, I don't see. It implies the independence of violation. Yeah, yeah but the, yeah. that implication doesn't go the other way. Just because I, I leave that 
just because I don't have this assumption doesn't imply super determinism. Well, I mean, first of all, in, in subjective probability, the fact that there is a determinism doesn't mean that you cannot have the distribution because that's the normal situation, not only in quantum mechanics, statistical mechanics, for instance. It's totally deterministic theory, but you can still talk about your ignorance uh, about which state is the initial state. No? Sure. Yeah. So that's the same in Bohm. I, I don't see why there is any problem. Here. No. It's, it's really neutral to the question of determinism or indeterminism. No? Well, if you really believe in strong super determinism at that level, you're, you're not allowed to reason about the separation um, uh, when you're doing experiment into what are the laws you're verifying and what are the initial conditions. And if you're not allowed to do that, there's an awful lot of truth that's not allowed. Yeah, super determinism is much worse than low locality. So, so it's much more fundamental. I mean, so the violation of super determinism. Well, the assumption is much more fundamental to any physics that we do. I mean, you have no, none of you have said what super determinism means. I mean, you have this criterion lambda that it's controlling around super determinism. Well, no, super determinism means uh, the way I understand is that uh, you cannot assume that, uh, uh, the, for instance, that uh, the measurement settings are external viable. And then it doesn't matter, I mean, that, uh, right. even if you have ontology that tells you that, uh, that, that everything is determined by the Big Bang, for instance, it still doesn't mean that you have super determinism because if you can, if you can for, all, for all your needs, I mean, you can, you can treat them as exter external viable, then, then you don't have super determinism. Because super determinism is not about determinism, it's about the ability to manipulate or to think about them it's something that, that's a viable, but I, I take it that there's, a, there's an issue here that I'm not sure if this is what is getting at, that there's already a tension in any, or even in ordinary physical theories between having, so Newtonian physics is deterministic, so it's deterministic. I mean, Tuck makes this point too, when he's in the empirical theories. What do you mean when you say you have freedom to manipulate the experimental apparatus, the detector settings? You know, the setting, it's already determined. So you have to, I think there's some, it's not at all trivial to just to sort of open up a notion of what you mean, by, but a notion of freedom yeah. uh, in the context of a deterministic or a stochastic theory. So that's why, I mean, I thought that the, the land independence criterion just is a criterion of probability distributions. Super determinism uh, seems a little bit vague. Yeah, and I mean, it can it means it has very different connotations to different people. I totally agree. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there was a point that I forgot I mean, to mention, and uh, some, uh, if you allow me, like 30 seconds or a minute, that is important actually. Um, some advantages of the Finetti's uh, approach. Um, if you go with the Finetti, uh, Remember that the problem, uh, if you go with classical probability, and you always get this as a theorem of probability, then if you assume mirror, that the, this probability mirror this probability, and you assume lambda independence, then you are immediately committed to this uh, inequality. Uh, but in definitely, you can assume mirror, and you can assume lambda independence, if you can, you know, uh, I mean, motivate it, and you won't get this inequality. What was the question you can assume? Uh, you can assume mirror. You can assume that probability of alpha. I understand the word. Uh, mirror. Mirror. Yeah, that, I, I call it mirror because it's it's this assumption um, that, that for each outcome, the distribution of outcome just reflects the distribution of uh, whatever it means. I mean, it's not so easy to make sense of that, but, but in the, in, in, I mean, whatever, uh, if, if you go with classical subjective probability theory, and for me, definitely is not totally classical, then if you assume this assumption that the probability of outcome, distribution of outcome reflect the distribution of the uh, spin, and you assume lambda independence, then you immediately committed to uh, the Bertha's and Horn inequalities that are violated in the experiment. But in definitely, you can still make this assumption and not be committed to this. 
So, um, and all, all you have to know, you don't have to know quantum mechanics, all you have to know that you cannot jointly verify A and A prime and B and B prime. That's all you need. In everything else, I mean, you know, it's just assumption that you make. I mean, and, you know, you don't know much about Bell theorem and all these things, and still you're not going to. So it's, it's some, it, it seems to me that this, this notion of verifiability is actually something that is good for your rationality, instrumental rationality. Yeah. Even if you don't want to be a subjectivist, to stand, there's something right about requiring that um, something like verifiability for the events that to which you want to uh, attribute probability. If you go back to probability being a guide to life, then it's only a guide to life when, you know, when life uh, moves along a bit, if you know whether the guide that led you correctly or not. So you need some sort of verifiability in there, even if you're not a probabilist or uh, subjectivist. I totally agree. I'm not definitely, I'm, I believe in objective probability, but I think that this is a good idea. Um, yeah. So, there are standard arguments against verifiability as the demarcation between what's scientific and what's not. And in the context of probability theory, I would have thought in science, we, you know, all the time as we make inferences between two verifiable things, we, we go through unverifiable things, right? So I can have a logical deduction where some of the things are unverifiable in the middle. And, and you know, logical deduction is just one aspect of probability theory. So, are you? So are you, are you in support of Dipanetti's use of the verification principle as criterion for the the appropriateness of assigning probabilities to anything? Because uh, no. a lot of what we do in science is it's not right. According to this. I mean, I'm more qualified in the sense that uh, I mean, um, just uh, what what I mean, uh, Richard uh, mentioned that. Uh, but I think that, uh, especially when you don't know what's going on, and you cannot verify two things together, uh, by giving a joint probability to them, you commit yourself. You restrict your probability more than I think you should. But I, I don't think that, uh, I'm not in favor of uh, positivist science, in the sense that, you know, if I cannot see you, I cannot observe, I mean, it's, uh, verifiability, I think, should be much more flexible. In, in that sense, uh, and uh, so I have sympathy. I mean, I'm not, yeah, I'm not a positivist, and I'm not subjectivist. But I think that there is something, something wise, in in being careful and instead of uh, just uh, distributing your probability, suspending judgment. Because that's basically, I mean, saying, uh, you know, I cannot have, I, I don't want to have a, a coherent judgment. You can have a judgment, degrees of belief that's psychological, it's beyond me. When it comes to probabilities, I can decide there is no probability. I can still do my science, I can still give probability to A and B, but I don't give probability to A and B. I think the uh, London Defense is a nice example of where I would want to um, attribute probability, unlike the Nettie according to you, yeah. because it plays an indirect role in generating probabilities for very viable etc. Yeah, I, it's it's a problem. I mean, it's a being. It's a very fine line because also if you think about the Finetti, the Finetti is subjectivist, and being subjectivist, the question is uh, for the Finetti probability theory is some you know coherent degrees of belief on the on the logic, but first you have to find and and it's about uncertain events. So first you have to find what are the certain events, construct you. Uh, your domain of uncertainty. I talk a little bit in the paper about it. And then have probabilities. Now, because you're a subjectivist, I mean, you might be incoherent in your domain of, you know, logic. And, and, and then you build probability theory on that. It is kind of tricky. But he is, in, in a sense, that's his commitment. I, I don't want to go all the way to this commitment, but, but I think he's in a sense, this is commitment. So, so in order to have probabilities, first you have to know what's certain and uncertain, and, 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 and that would require a lot of deductions that you either cannot do, or you, you might well make mistakes. But, uh, but it seems to me that 
it's uh, I don't see why you have to distribute over a and a prime, for instance, in order to do science. If you cannot verify, you can still you can do a lot of physics, and uh, and uh, you can also I mean, in that case. <coughs> If, if you don't follow the finality, and I don't, I, I think that the finality would be a bit hesitant, I mean, to derive the, the theorem, but you can still derive the theorem, uh, the, the bad inequalities. But I don't know, I mean, it's kind of intuition. But this, in this paper, it was more philosophical reflection. It's not, uh, I'm not committed to any of the, the things. Thanks. Sorry to go for lunch so much here. We'll cut you away. Any questions?